Hi, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and I am here today with Ezra Singer. We are going to be talking about negotiating your salary even during a pandemic. Ezra is a former Fortune 10 executive, and uh, he has a great depth of experience and expertise when it comes to negotiating your salary. Ezra, we're so glad to have you here. Well, thank you, Dory. Good to be here. And hello to the audience. Wonderful. And we want to hear from everybody who actually is uh, is in the audience. So please go ahead, type into the chat box where you're from. Uh, we want to hear what's going on. We want to take your questions as well. And Ezra, let me go ahead and, and start by asking you the first question, which is, this is a time when it actually seems like a lot of people may be wondering, uh, is it appropriate to, to actually ask for a raise? And I am uh, curious, during a pandemic, um, how do we think about that? Is this a time that people can actually get more money or do we have to be really cautious? Sure. Uh, it's a great question. And the short answer is what I'm seeing is people, companies are hiring during the pandemic. They're hiring and even more so they're willing to negotiate. And the, if, you know, if they're, you're a top talent and they want you, there, there's room to negotiate. I, you know, I've thought about it. Initially, you would have thought there would have been a freeze on hiring or companies would be hard and fast, and they're not. I've had two situations recently within the past two months. One is, is, is an executive who she worked at a pharmaceutical company, had been laid off, was applying for a new job, a senior role, very senior role. They offered her the role. The money was generally good, where we wanted to see if we, she could do any better. We had a strategy and she ended up getting an additional $400,000 in the stock grant during the pandemic. Uh, another client was offered a position in finance in a significant role and, and the money was lower than she had hoped for. It was the only offer she had. She was also out of work and in negotiations, she ended up getting an additional $200,000 a year annually over the initial offer. And the takeaway is again, if you're a good candidate, you're a solid candidate and they want you, there's, you know, there's room to move on negotiations. Ezra, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, just to just to give you a little alert here, it, I think there's uh, we're getting a viewer report of a little bit of feedback on your end. So I am taking the liberty of muting you while I'm talking, but I will unmute you when when it is uh, your turn to talk. So just in case uh, you're th thrown off temporarily, know that I am I am controlling the mute button. Uh, so thank you for that. So it's it's fascinating to hear that even during this economically challenged time, that it sounds like there's actually a, a lot of opportunity for people to be getting uh, more money than they than they might have imagined. So let me actually um, ask a question. So during your time working in the corporate world, you were you were a you know a senior HR leader uh, at you know a very large company. What is it from your time working in the trenches? You know you. The problem, I think, for for so many of us, you know, who are on the other end of it, who are actually trying to get the job, is that you're doing a negotiation. I don't know, once every two years, five years, ten years, but on the other side of it, the company is doing hundreds or thousands of negotiations. You have so much more information, and so I'm curious, from your experience, what is it that that you know? What is it that the companies know that the people don't know? And hopefully there's no feedback as I'm talking. Please let me know if there is. Um, in my experience, when I worked, uh, you know, led HR at Verizon or Lenovo or limited brands, I was involved in the hiring of hundreds, literally hundreds of senior executives. And all but one left money on the table. All but one. I knew what we were willing to pay them and they didn't get there. And you know, I, I thought about it a lot, and there were really three reasons why they were not able to optimize their pay. One is they didn't know the market, but that's that's pretty easy to get. You know, we have data for that. Two, they didn't know how to ask, and three, they didn't know how to deal with no. So, not knowing the market, not knowing how to ask, 
and not knowing how to deal with no. And again, if you can figure those parts out, you really have an opportunity to improve you know, your compensation significantly. Well, Ezra, I think I think that's really fascinating, and I want to dive into each of them. So, first of all, let's start at the basic level: knowing the market. I imagine these days it's probably easier than it was in the past. That you know, at, at a basic level, you could maybe look on Glassdoor or something like that. But how would you recommend if someone is trying to suss things out? Maybe they're applying to a new job. Maybe they are trying to see if uh, if they should get a raise or determine if they're underpaid. How would you recommend that someone actually start getting market intelligence about what the appropriate rate is for their position? So it's a, it depends on what level you're at. We'll start with that. At the most senior levels, again, you can get market data. There are consulting firms. I have market data. But what I found is that's not as critical when you're changing jobs. And we can get to that in a bit. But Glassdoor, salary.com, all of those places have market data and there are ranges. So market data will be based on the size of the company, bigger the company, the, the more they're likely to pay. It'll be data on what your role is, what your region is. So depending where you are in an organization, you know, again, through these other sources, you can easily figure out the range. And everybody, and I mean everybody, wants to be at the top of the range. And it's not unreasonable if you're a good performer to say, here's the data as I understand it. And given my performance, it, it, you know, I would like to be at the top of the range. Also very important to show the value, if you're looking at a raise, the value you're bringing to the company. So I would never go in and just say, look, you know, I'm getting paid X, but the market indicates that I should get paid at X plus. And then they say, well, okay, but we have budgets or, or whatever, and they'll have their own data. It's here's the value I brought. I added this much revenue. I saved these many dollars. I built in this level of client satisfaction. And with that and the market, I feel my performance warrants an increase. Don't go in, say, telling them it's an ultimatum unless you're willing to leave. And I'll talk a bit more about attitudes, but just say this is what I'm hoping to get. Because if you say, if I don't get this, I'm leaving, be prepared to leave. Yeah, that's powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ezra. And I'd like to give a shout out to the folks who are here in the audience. We're so glad to have you here. We have Trisha in Pennsylvania. We've got Toronto, New Jersey, New Hampshire in the house, Oregon. Uh, we have Washington, D.C., Rome, Italy. Amazing. So if you are tuning in, please feel free. Type your uh, type your information into the chat box. You know, where where are you calling in from slash viewing us from? We'd love to, uh, to hear you. And also, of course, we're going to be taking questions for Ezra. Uh, this is a big topic, right? You know, can, can you, should you be getting more money at your job? Are you leaving money on the table? We want to find out. So please feel free to type your uh, comments and your questions into the chat box uh, so that we can tackle them here with Ezra. And of course, if you are enjoying the conversation, hit like and hit share so that other people can benefit from it as well. So Ezra, a, a question that I have for you, you were alluding earlier to the fact that the, the first challenge is that people don't know the market, they don't know their market value. Uh, a second question you said, which I think is interesting, is that people don't necessarily know how to ask. So what does, what does that mean? What's the right way to ask? Obviously, this is uh, kind of a sensitive thing. Uh, in our culture, people don't like to talk about money. So I can imagine they might get a little nervous. They don't really know what to do. But you've seen this literally thousands of times. What's the right way people should be asking? It, it, it is. It's hard for people to negotiate for themselves for a variety of reasons. Some people I work with, they're very, very successful, but they may have a bit of what you call the imposter syndrome. I had a client who was a very successful CFO. She was switching jobs and she, she had performed very well. Companies were after her. And she said, deep down, I'm not really sure I'm worth that much. And I don't know if I can really go ask for more. And, and so, a lot of people suffer from that or they're uncomfortable. I found with some females that I've worked with for all the sociological reasons we're aware of, you know, many were brought up not to be assertive and want to get along and how will people feel about me? 
So the right way to ask, starting, and this is probably the, the, the most important tip I can give people, is as you're going through, you're changing jobs, and the internal or external recruiter will say, they no, they no longer can ask you what you're making. The law has been passed to change that, primarily because women were, t were making less than men, and if each person was gonna get a 10% increase, that pay disparity would continue. So the big tip here is don't tell them what you're looking to make. Let me repeat that. Don't tell them what you're looking to make. This goes to the first point also of knowing the market. Companies have ranges. Every time I, we've looked to hire anybody in my career, we knew generally what we were willing to pay them. There was a range. At the senior executive level, it's a very wide range. Throughout the organization, there were ranges. And these ranges can go from 20,000 to 50,000 to a couple hundred thousand. When they hire a recruiter, they tell the recruiter the range of what they're looking to pay. It's, and the big mistake people make is they say, you know, let's say, what are you looking to make? And they'll come up with a number. And let's say it's a range for a senior position you know, between 700,000 and a million or a lower level position between you know, 80,000 and 120,000. If you say you're looking to make, you know, for the first between 700,000 and a million, you say you're looking to make 800 or 850, or the one between 80 and 120, you say you're looking to make 90, you've put a cap on what they'll pay you. Whereas if you let them come to you and tell them, you know, again, hold off answering what you're looking to make, you now have a whole wider range. So one of the most important takeaways would be don't tell them what you're looking to make. Ezra, I think that's a really interesting point. Let me just ask a follow-up on that. What if they say, hey, Ezra, what are you looking to make? How do you, how do you deflect that without looking like a, like a jerk or saying, I'm sorry, I won't answer your question? Like, How, how can you nicely push that off? Very, very valid question. I'm glad you asked that. And what I advise clients to say is, let's not talk compensation till we've gone through the interviews and we're both comfortable that I'm a good fit for the organization from your end, from my end, and that I can add significant value. And they, it, it tends to work. Uh, you know, again, if you've got the resume they're interested in, and you know, always think from my end, the recruiter, is an intermediary. The hiring manager is the key. So the hiring manager will see some resumes and if she really likes your resume and then the recruiter comes back and says, well, you know, Dory won't tell me what she's looking to make, but the, the hiring manager likes your resume, nine times out of 10 or 99 out of 100, the hiring manager, says, well, bring her in. Bring her in, let me meet with her and then we'll see. And then once you've, they brought you in and they really like you, that's going to increase your leverage of what they're willing to pay you. Really interesting point. Thank you very much, Ezra. That's great. And I see we have new friends who are joining us. We have Collier in Charlotte. Hey there. We have uh, San Francisco. We have New Orleans. We have Lena from Copenhagen. Uh, we have Kanan who I, I think sounds like your neighbor. He's in St. Petersburg like you, Ezra. That's great. Uh, we have Marcin from Poland. Oh my goodness. This is, uh, this is great. Welcome everybody. And great questions coming in. I'm going to be asking them to Ezra momentarily. So feel free, please ask your questions in the chat box. We'd love to tackle them. But before we get to that, I just wanted to turn to a question that you had alluded to earlier at the outset, Ezra, of this conversation, which is that the third mistake that people make where they are leaving money on the table is that they don't know how to respond to a no. What should they be doing if they get a no? Sure. Uh, well, a no is in terms of, it's really when they have an offer and the offer is not what they wanted, or even if the offer is they wanted, and the question is, how do you negotiate now, and how do you get more? And it becomes very, very strategic in how you do it. You know, keep in mind that compensation is not all salary. So there's base, there's annual bonus, there's stock. 
uh, hopefully, a stock that goes up. And, uh, and there's also possibilities of sign-offs. So when you know they come back, you, you get an offer, and you know you say you were hoping for more. Again, I'll, I'll break it into parts. One is your attitude. So when you get the offer, be enthusiastic. Say to them, "I'm really excited about this company," but and again, I I don't recommend doing ultimatums unless you're really willing to walk away. Say, but I, there's a salary, there's a compensation gap that I'm hoping. I'm hoping we can close that gap. Then be very strategic in terms of what you're asking for. What is most important to you? Is it cash salary? Is it bonus? Is it stock? And ask for a reasonable number. And again, I had a client, again, during the pandemic, where she was offered a position where the base was 285, bonus was 100% of that, and stock. And she really wanted to get a, the number in her head was 300. And strategically, what we did is she asked for 315. And they told her there's no room to move. And we figured they wanted her. Again, they've made the decision they want to hire you. Are they going to go back to the CEO or CFO to say we lost her over $30,000? Most likely not. I mean, I just know how this works. And so she was able to get to the thing 315. They split the difference to three. That it added on her bonus of 100%. So it was an additional $30,000 a year by thinking strategically on how to ask. And then the, the last part on that is, is um, if you see you're at log jams, the companies will look at two things when determining what to pay you. It's, in, it's external equity, which is the market. They have their ranges. And then internal equity. And internal equity is, you know, Dory, we understand you're looking for more money, but we've got three other people doing a similar job and we can't pay you more than we're paying them. That's internal equity. It becomes a big issue. And one way to break that log jam is to say, okay, let's do a sign on them. And again, I mentioned, you know, clients that have gotten sign-ons in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and it doesn't hurt internal equity because then on the internal sheets, when they say these four people are all making roughly the same and the sign-ons on a different budget line. So uh, again, it won't be people saying, well, how can so-and-so make more than me? Ezra, that's a really interesting point. Thanks for thanks for raising that. Um, it seems like there's a lot of different ways that people can uh, can maneuver around this. And so I see some great questions that have come in that I'd love to uh, to tackle. Again, if you are watching this and you are enjoying it, uh, please hit like, please hit share, so other people can benefit from it. And uh, we are here every Thursday at noon Eastern, nine Pacific. Uh, it is, I am pretty sure. Oh my goodness! Uh, it, wow, I'm being barrage um we are uh oh okay we are we are going to yeah put that far away uh so anyway uh we are uh here every noon uh on thursdays and if you would like to tune in uh you can actually be sure to do that you can just follow linkedin you can follow newsweek on linkedin make sure that you click the follow button also follow me dory clark on LinkedIn, and you will get notifications about these great things. So a question, Ezra, came in uh, from Annette, and I think this is a terrific one. She says, would love some advice to help new college graduates with their entry-level position negotiations. Uh, these guys are probably not negotiating for equity. They're probably not uh, getting massive sign-on bonuses. What would you do for someone that's new to the job market? You know, I'd start with how marketable are you? If this is the only offer you get and you're in an industry that doesn't seem it's going to be hiring a lot, then you're going to be very limited in your negotiations. You can try. And again, as Dory mentioned, you, know, you can look through glassdoor.com, salary.com, other places, just to get a sense of the market in your area. Still try the same way in terms of not telling them what you're looking to make Often online, they'll ask you to fill in a salary. And, and sometimes it works if you just prep, type in 0000 or 1111 and it gets you through the process. 
again, if they're asking you what you're looking to make, say, well, tell me, you know, what you, what the job is paying there, or, or wait for them to come to you, and then you can still ask. I, I've had two situations with, with recent graduates that that, that I've helped out. Um, one was um, pretty marketable, and, and she was going to one of the consulting firms, and they wanted her a whole lot, and, and so we were able to get her an additional 15, 20 percent over what they offered. The other person was not that marketable and really wanted the job. And um, you know, they made her an offer. She asked for more, and, and she was very she was very afraid. You know, one of the fears people have in that is that if you ask for more, will they pull the offer? It's a natural fear. I, as I work with my clients, we actually go through analysis of that in terms of what odds you give they'll pull the offer. I've never ever see pulled an offer in my hiring or with any of my clients have them you know the offer pulled the key is ask nicely ask enthusiastically ask positively this is the company i want to go to and, and don't ask for an outrageous number this one client where it didn't work she took the job because it was the industry she wanted and quite frankly it was the one job offer and afterwards her boss said to her good try so she didn't lose anything. You know, the two parts of the analysis I do at any level is one, um, again, what odds do you give that they'll pull the offer? And two, do you think it'll hurt the relationship? And this is as you're starting out in net or at your higher level, if you think by asking for more, it's going to harm the relationship, then really question whether you should ask for more because money is nice, but you're going to be working with this person and you're going to have a career there, hopefully. And if you think it'll harm the relationship, maybe tone back the ask. Yeah, Ezra, I think that's really that's really interesting. And I'm curious, do you have a script by chance, sort of a sample script? You know, when you say ask, ask nicely, uh, obviously that implies it wouldn't be an ultimatum. You know, I deserve X and I'm going to walk if I don't get X. So we know not to do that. But if if I get an offer that is below what I've been wanting or what I've been expecting, um, can you give me some sample verbiage? Like, how would I actually say that that would be a kind of nice, positive way to handle this? Sure. Uh, Ms. Hi Ms. Clark, Ms. Hiring Manager, uh, I'm really excited about the offer. I really appreciate the offer, and I'm certain I can add real value to the company. Uh, I was hoping that the compensation would be either, say, X, or the offers for $50,000, and you know, based on what I know of the market, I was hoping the compensation would be in the $60,000 range. And maybe you're aiming for 55 at this point in time. And you know, I really hope we can close this gap. I am sure that I'll really be worth it and contribute value well in excess of that. So that's pretty much the script. Ezra, that's great. I love it. That is a money script. Thank you for that. And we have some fantastic other questions that have come in. This is one from Marissa. She wants to know, what if the initial offer is within the range, even at the high end, but do you do you still negotiate for more? Like, you know, we, we don't want to be stupid about it. So like, should we always ask for more? Is that a good idea? Or what would you recommend? Oh, and sorry, let me unmute you here. What would you recommend, Ezra? So things I've learned from coaching uh, is never say always, and never say never, two things. Uh, my wife points that out to me <laughs> in other contexts. But uh, so I would ask for more. I mean, it's what will it hurt? If you're comfortable that they're not going to pull the offer, it's not going to harm the relationship, why not ask? I mean, one example I gave at a much higher level, you know, the client in the pharmaceutical industry was paid very, very well. She asked nicely. We had a strategy. I mean, other things to think about is who to ask at higher levels. You know, do you talk to the hiring manager? Do you talk to the internal recruiter, the external recruiter? But yeah, again, you, you, if the offer's at the high end of the range. Try the same script. What does it hurt? 
Ezra, that's great. Thank you. So many good questions coming in, guys. This is fantastic. Uh, and again, uh, please make sure, you know, open it up in a new window. F click follow Newsweek on LinkedIn. Click follow me on uh, on LinkedIn to make sure you are uh, you are getting all of this information. Go to doryclark.com slash LinkedIn, and you can subscribe to my weekly LinkedIn newsletter and make sure that you are updated and apprised on all of these conversations. Uh, and so a wonderful question came in from Todd, uh, he wants to know, how should you respond to startups that want to offer a lower salary now in exchange for equity, but the person needs the money now? How do you handle that? Todd does a lot of coaching and wants to know how he should counsel his clients. What is, what is your take on the equity question for startups, Ezra? Hello, Todd. Uh, it's a great question. So startups generally won't have as much money. They're paying more these days. And I'll, I'll put two parts in, in your group. There are startups and there are also portfolio companies owned by private equity firms. Both of them will have very strong emphasis on stock. Portfolio companies of private equity will pay more cash. Startups won't have cash. Short answer one is if your client needs the cash to live on, and it's reality that that might not be the job for them. I've got one client now that I'm working with who came from a major corporation, was out of work, has an offer now with a startup, and the cash is very, very low. So he's in a situation that his severance from his old job was very, very generous so he can live on significantly less cash. If your client doesn't need the money, the cash to live on, there's nothing wrong with needing the money to live on. But if he or she doesn't need it, then look at the equity. But also I advise my clients, Todd and others, look at the equity carefully. That you know, the company will say to you as a startup, for, first of all, you know, instead of getting an annual stock grant, let's say you know, 10,000 or whatever dollars every year worth of stock, you know, you'll want to negotiate a percentage of the company. So your client's coming in and you want to get 1% of the company, 2%, whatever role they're going into. And obviously the bigger the company, the smaller the percentage they get. Then the company, the startup will say, well, 1% of the company and the company is worth a million, you know, $10 million now, it's worth a hundred thousand, but we're gonna be worth a billion in four years. And then your 1% is gonna be worth a whole lot more money. And as you analyze the offer, what I say is build in a risk factor. So they say it's going to be worth a billion. What odds do you really give that of happening? And if you give it 50% odds, discount the value of the stock by 50%. The other thing that's very important in all situations, but particularly startups and portfolio companies, is as you're hired, make sure you negotiate the separation provisions. So they can be saying to you, you're gonna get significant stock that's gonna be worth a million, $10 million when the company hits a billion. But what if they fire you beforehand? Have you lost it all? And so you wanna make sure you've negotiated and built in provisions that if this has a vesting period of four years and, there's a, you, know, and you don't get any money till there's a, an exit or a liquidation event or they go public, what happens if they let you go? If you quit, you're not gonna get it, that's easy. If they fire you for cause, you're not gonna get it. But what if it's just not a good match? You wanna make sure you've got provisions there to protect you. And in the hiring phase, that's the time to do it. Such a good point, Ezra, this is great. We are coming to the denouement of our uh, of our time together. We probably have time for two more quick questions. Uh, the wonderful questions coming in about this, this very hot topic. Of course, lots of people are curious about the question of how do you negotiate your salary even during a pandemic? We're here with Ezra Singer, negotiation expert. So Ezra, um, before, uh, before we wrap up, uh, two more quick questions. A great one came from Kate at kind of the other end of the spectrum, right? Todd was asking about startups. Kate wants to know about nonprofits. How do you handle it if the salary is, is sort of tied to or built into the project funding? Uh, presumably, it's kind of a little bit more fixed that way. But how would, how would you begin to think about that? A, a great question, Kate. A couple different ways. I mean, one is every year, you know, not, I'm on the board of some not-for-profits, every year they build their budget out. You need to make a case for them 
in terms of why you should get paid more. It, it, it's not that different than private sector, except the numbers are going to be lower. I mean, clearly the not-for-profit doesn't pay as well as for profit, but go through salary.com, Glassdoor, uh, other you know, search places to see what these jobs are paying. And if you're looking to negotiate your salary, you're already there, make the same argument of the value you're adding. If you're moving into the job, again, same strategy. The other thing we've done with some not-for-profits, and this is a bit controversial, is particularly if you're in development or you're the head of the not-for-profit, is build in a bonus that can be based on, one is new revenue achieved. I've seen one situation where we've said to the CEO who's coming on board, we can pay you X, that's built into our plan. However, for every X dollars of new money you raise above last year's campaign, you will get a percentage of that. Like a sales plan almost. Excellent. Ezra, thank you so much. That is fantastic. And our last question, we have time for, for just one more. So many great questions. And just as a reminder to everybody, if you are enjoying and have enjoyed this uh, conversation, hit the like button and hit the share button so that others, uh, your contacts and colleagues in LinkedIn can see it and benefit from it as well. And so the last question actually comes in on the other end of the spectrum. This is interesting and may impact a lot of people who themselves are business owners or hiring managers, uh, Darcy wants to know, could you, you know, what would you do? Can you give a script or how to handle it for an employer that's already at their max? They, they, they already are offering as much as they possibly can, but the candidate has expectations that are out of line with reality. What would you do in that situation, Ezra? Darcy, hello, Darcy. It's, it's a great question. And again, the short answer is you explain to them your internal and external equity. You also see, are there different things you can offer them that may be important? Could it be ability to, well, I used to say in the old days, ability to work from home, but you know that, that's no longer uh, a unique thing. Could, could it be a career path and say to them, look, this is all we can do, but we really want to hire you. We think you'd be phenomenal for the organization. Again, is there a way you can give them some sort of signing bonus? Uh, extra vacation can be challenging if other, you know, if that's going to disrupt your internal equity, but maybe that can be there. Or say, and I've had a client, uh, you know, where this happened, and they said, come on board. I had two clients recently with this, come on board, and within a year, if your performance is as we expect it to be, we will bump you up. The one client I mentioned before, uh, who ended up with 300 a year, they said to her, if your performance is as we expect it to be, this was part of the negotiation, we'll get you to 330 a year from now. So think of what you can offer them that will be meaningful, maybe not immediately, or maybe not in the cash area. Fantastic and so helpful. Ezra Singer, thank you so much for joining us. This is really a wonderful conversation. We have been, of course, uh, during our time here talking about how to negotiate your salary. Even during a pandemic, we've been with Mr. Ezra Singer, who's uh, joined us. If you are interested in conversations like these to make you better at work, you can tune in every Thursday, noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, 5 p.m. GMT. And uh, make sure to follow me at doryclark.com if you would like to subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter and be alerted about these great conversations. Please feel free to subscribe at doryclark.com slash LinkedIn. And an another uh, just warm thanks. Uh, Ezra, any, any final uh, parting words or advice? Uh, well, Dory, first of all, thanks to you. Thanks to the audience. And, and then for the listeners, again, three points, you know, key, to, you know, to think about it is one, don't tell them what you're looking for to start with. Two, be comfortable with negotiating back and forth. And three, attitude is critical. Relationships are critical and go into it with a very positive attitude. Wonderful advice. Ezra Singer, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us. We will see you next Thursday uh, on right here. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, click the like and share button and take care and have a wonderful week.